This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Ryan Templeman, man. Thank you for coming on the show, brother. Yeah, man. Great to be here. We are here to talk about distribution and how to make some money with film in the film business and, and your unique approach to it. So we're, we're going to get into the weeds here, everybody. But before we get started, how did you get into the business? Because I... I heard through the grapevine, High School the Musical or something. Oh, hi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something. So please explain yourself, sir. Yeah. So I uh, so I started actually at the Gateway Drug, right? The Gateway Drug, which is acting. That acting bug bit me, and uh, I mutated into a, a carnival freak. And, and, you know, like a circus freak, where I just fell down this this well, where I just love this business, and I had a opportunity to be in a high school musical and i did the best thing to come of that was that i became a, a south park character that when they made fun of uh, when they made fun of high school musical they have my character uh basically turned into a south park character Genius. so it was actually yeah it was that's probably the the highlight of my entire life you uh, um <laughs> you've you've arrived sir i don't even know why you're speaking to me so yeah. <laughs> well <laughs> you know the reality is behind it is that once you kind of get into it and you start to like see the, 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 the uh, all the back end side of things like so once you get on the set you realize kind of how small the the actor is you are the face of the franchise but at the end of the day like there's tons of things that are happening kind of all around you and whole kinds of things that are happening before you even get there and after you get there and so for me i just found that I was just fascinated with this whole process and I really wanted to understand the whole thing holistically. So I started writing uh, about the time actually that I was in High School Musical, which was years and years ago. I don't even remember 15 or more years ago, probably 17 years ago, mm -hmm. actually. Um, and so I started writing and creating scripts and things for myself, started doing short films, uh, started producing those things, started acting in them. And I knew how to edit, so I started doing the post-production piece as well. So and that's kind of what I ended up uh, that's getting into. How I kind of got into this whole game. Yeah. So yeah. you you reached out to me. Um, a friend of our, Rob Hardy, actually reached out to me and said, "Hey, I had this yeah. great conversation with this filmmaker about this new business model that I think you really should talk to him." So we spoke, and uh, I wanted to hear. I want you to explain to the tribe, what is this new distribution business model that, that's making money or can potentially help filmmakers make money? Well, it's not necessarily a new distribution model. It's a Frankenstein of kind of the, tradi the traditional business model and the business model that we're now in. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably best to talk about, uh, maybe let's just go to the traditional business model is getting blown up and you've got an episode about that, which I would encourage people to go and check out. But essentially, um, the, the theatrical uh, exhibition is is basically going away for the major studios. That is not part of their their business calculus anymore. And so look at Disney, for example. Disney owns 47% of the market share, but they are only going to create 17 films. So that is not enough to cover all those weekends. And that's only one segment of an audience. And so, you know, the president of AMC, Adam Aaron, basically says, like, we need more movies, right? These major studios are in a 16 a week or 17 a week, uh, you know, weekends a year. And but that's not servicing what is our theatrical exhibition. And so we see reboots, remakes, sequels, tentpoles, franchises, all this, you know, regurgitation uh, of, of old IP because that's the easiest thing to market. But what we're realizing is that that audiences aren't engaging with those things because we, as we become more and more digital, right, you and I are talking right now, like not in the same room. Mm -hmm. And and that's amazing, but what we're actually finding, uh, and I, this is my background, is in marketing, is that we want human connection. And so that's what people are engaging with. And if you look at online, the influencers, right, we want to connect with human beings. And our theatrical spaces is actually a good place to do that, to be shoulder to shoulder with somebody enjoying the same thing. Because when you hear them laugh, right, that gives you, uh, you know, that serotonin that, that makes you feel good and feel like you're part of a community. And that's what we need. But those big businesses can't compete in that space because they're not human. They're not human. There's no, who's the face of Warner? Mm -hmm. 
it or was Disney. the face of Paramount. Yeah, or Disney, exactly. I mean, it was Walt, but back in the, like, but we don't have that face anymore. And this is, you know, and so people want that thing. And so this is why we engage with uh, actors and celebrities, because that's what draws us to things, right? So uh, we recognize that um, that person as a vehicle of empathy. It's the, the protagonist or it's the antagonist or what whoever it is that is in this um, film that you 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 relate to that's who you travel through the journey of the film with and as you see and recognize those people more and more frequently even though you don't necessarily know them like i again i'm sitting here chatting with you i listen to your podcast and i think you're doing you do great work right but i feel like i know you but we, this is only the you know the second or third time that we've ever chatted mm -hmm. and so you you are a vehicle for me that, that I imbue you with a certain uh, familiarity. And so it's the same thing with our films. The, that's why you go out and you get, you know, talent that people recognize. It doesn't have to be a list. You just have to recognize the talent because that's how you bring the people in. It's, this is my trusted vehicle for how I get into the film. And so independent filmmakers then have a huge opportunity in front of them with the theatrical space because, uh, the the uh, the major studios are pivoting a huge amount of their resources away from the theatrical space mm -hmm. and into streaming, and with that they're going to now have to start creating crazy amounts of content, almost unsustainable amounts of content. Uh, and you look at uh, Netflix, I think is somewhere 15 around billion. fifteen billion, fifteen, and then they added two uh, two billion just recently. Um, and you can expect that basically everyone is going to follow suit to some capacity. I think Apple is at eight billion. Uh, I heard Peacock is somewhere in that seven billion. Um, you know, Paramount uh, Network and uh, uh, HBO Max and all of these content providers have they have this giant catalog that's going to get people to start the subscription. But the only way to keep people is new content. And so their business calculus inside that is going to be two things. Uh, does it bring me new subscribers? And does it retain the subscribers that I have? That's it. That's all those business models are going to care about. So, and you see this with uh, Netflix, as they dial up the spend on their original series, they drop a lot more stand-up comedy specials and kind of, you know, mid-tier documentaries and things like that. Things that are low cost for them so that they can always have something new. Just ton every, every week there's a new stand-up comedy Well, special. this is you. I, I mean, man, you. how much content do you put out just to maintain the audience you have? <laughs> now, I'm not even kidding. Like, I mean, now scale that. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I don't. Sp my, my spend was $8 billion last year. I'm thinking of going to $10 billion <laughs> for my content, but I'm, I'm, I might go just 9 I'm not sure yet. Um, but no, that, uh, be, to be honest, on a business standpoint, one of the reasons why I've been able to um, really penetrate the audience that I'm going after, which are filmmakers, screenwriters, content creators, is because of the massive amount of content that I put out and the massive amount of energy that I put out on a weekly basis that nobody else has really tried to do or, or figured out how to do the same way I do it or with the way I do it. And it's that the same model works with what this with the studios and the streaming services are doing. I'm just doing it for less than $8 billion. <laughs> well, and we don't need... Yeah. Well, and you shouldn't also discount the fact that you are doing this genuinely, right? Like, Correct. So you are you are the face of your franchise. Indie Film Hustle is not anything other than basically Alex Ferrari. Right. The Alex Ferrari I can't, Hustle it'd be, show. Right? It'd be hard to sell Indie Film Hustle without me. So like if a company yeah. came in, like you could sell Disney. You know, you, right. could, you could sell Apple. I mean, I don't know who'd buy it, but, you know, <laughs> who could afford it? You know, you could sell Netflix, but the, but I'm glad that I'm putting Indie Film Hustle in that category, so I appreciate you. Yeah, 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 you're, um, yeah, you're there. I appreciate that. But, no, it's very difficult to sell this, this business without me attached to it because I am the face of the business, and that's what makes the business run. And there's many, you know, many companies that do that. Um, and I know like there was a couple other uh, other brands within our niche that tried doing that, but when they lost the main guy, and YouTube shows happen all the time where the YouTube show host changes and everything drops because yeah. they're attached to that person. Well, and this kind of goes into exactly what you always talk about, right? Like you talk about the niche 
right? Well, the niche is the people who look at Alex Ferrari and go, this is the dude, like this is the guy, right? Uh, this is the guy whose material that I want to see. And so filmmakers do need to focus on the niche, but what niche people want is actually to then project the thing that they think is niche into a wider space, right? Mm -hmm. So um, a good example, which I try not to use, but like um, Napoleon Dynamite, right? Napoleon Dynamite, and uh, they use this film all the time to be like, look, Napoleon Dynamite was made for- yeah, It's an outlier. Yeah. It's an outlier, it's an out but, the, but the principles are solid. The principle behind it is solid, right? Because what is the point of Napoleon Dynamite? It's about a small town in Idaho. And so that's very niche content. But what that content did is it created a funny affectation of basically like uh, who these people are. And guess what? Those are the people that grabbed onto it and said, this thing is hysterical, this is about us. And they projected that out into the world. And I mean, everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and same thing with Big Fat Greek Wedding. I mean, I mean, that was yeah. another one that was just like, oh, it's about a Greek family. Like, no, it's about every family. And then everybody grabbed onto it and it exploded to what it became. It, it's, all re it's all relative. Uh, you know, I, I actually use... Um, Napoleon Dynamite in my new book, uh, The Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, as a model. And I even say, I'm like, this is an outlier. But the principles of what happened here are sound, as opposed to Blair Witch Project or Paranormal Activity, which were complete lottery tickets and yeah. cannot be replicated. But the concepts behind a Napoleon Dynamite or Big Fat Greek Wedding can be replicated if you use the base concepts correctly. And there has to be a little bit of lightning strike to make that work as well. Yeah, but with any successful any successful property has some sort of uh, lightning strike to an mm -hmm. extent, right? And that's why, because it's such a risky business, like uh, you look at best practices when it comes to best practices of of the business. So, just because we're independent doesn't mean that we should not look at what the industry does that's best practices. And if you look at just the traditional model, what they're doing is they're diversifying their risk across multiple properties. So, so are you familiar with Slated? I am, sir. Okay, so Slated has like this rubric where they basically are talking about uh, independent films and, and theatrically released independent films. They do a study from, uh, I can't remember the dates, I think it's 2012 to 17 or 18 or something like that. But basically what they, they show is that the number of winners and losers at the box office are about equal. It's about 50%, which shouldn't be terribly surprising because those are businesses that have actually gotten to their point of sale, which is the theatrical space. And the losers make back, you know, on average, you know, about uh, a, a point two five ROI. But the winners are making back like a 3.35 ROI. So if you put those things together, right, the, the overall is a 2.41 ROI. So just, and, and for everybody, yeah, return on investment. So everybody knows yeah, what yeah, ROI sorry. is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, and so, and a 2.4 is a decent return. Now, people who invest, uh, they want like the 4X and they want the 10X and they want these giant uh, returns. But a 4X, um, can happen if you have just one of those kind of, let's say you made four films, uh, one of them's a winner, one of them's a loser, one of them's a winner, one of them's a loser. The rubric basically is that you would get 2.41 return on investment. That's mm -hmm. what Slated's data tells us. Mm -hmm. But investors want that 4X number. So you would really need to hit a home run in one of these things in order to hit that four or even a 10X, and those are unicorns, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to make money in the film industry, then uh, you just have to make lots and lots and lots of films. And that's what that's what everyone says, right? You just have to make lots and lots of films. The problem is, is if you don't make a great first film, it's really hard to get your second, and it's really even harder to get your third, especially if these two didn't do well. And so what happens is, is our artists, get one chance. And so we put all this pressure on these artists to make a film that's going to give them a career. And that's not fair, mm -hmm. especially for a first time filmmaker. That's not fair. Like my first film, yeah, I would hate to have that be the only thing that people ever judge me on it. And, and the, same sorts of, the same sort of pressure is put on everyone. And then once you have that first one, how do you get the second one? Because now you want to try and scale up. You want to try and keep moving the ball forward. And so, 
what we ought to be doing as independent filmmakers, and this is the business model, is creating a career, play the long game. So get four filmmakers that each have their own story to tell, and you work together. But you have to work within the model that exists. So how do we value what a film is? Now we're talking value. What's the value of a film? Well, we know the value of the film based on the budget because we always talk about the budget of this film is X amount. Budget and cost are not the same thing. It's not the same at all. My budget could be $12 million, but I only ever spend $3 million. So the, so that's the value is 12, the spend is only three. And how do you calculate the value? So you calculate the value by taking the script and going through it the way that a line producer does. So this is what all the studios do. They go through and they say, it costs me X amount of money based on the DGA rules, the WGA rules, the SAG-AFTRA, uh, IOTC, and they go through the whole thing. Like, I absolutely need X amount of things for this film. These are the hard costs. And then they make phone calls and they basically get the bids for what these things cost. And then when the film is actually made, they put those real costs to the film at the end of the day. And then they know exactly what that film budget is. But mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean what was spent. They'll spend on the things that are hard costs, right? They'll spend on, you know, renting the equipment, but they'll spend on talent, know, the, for sure. the talent, and they'll spend on those things they absolutely have to have. But they already have an infrastructure. A lot of these major studios have an infrastructure. So they're portioning, it's an, an apportionment of their actual people that are inside that is creating this thing called soft money. And soft money isn't like a tangible hard asset. It is Alex Ferrari is working for Warner Brothers at $100,000 a year. But on this film, he is the writer and the director. So he gets a DGA minimum and he gets a right uh, and he gets a, a WGA scale. minimum. Mm -hmm. And both of those are going to be uh, combined are going to be somewhere in that, you know, 160000 or whatever. So because I only pay you uh, 100K a year as my employee, I've created 60k in soft money okay see so uh, so you can do this same sort of thing at the independent level and at the independent level essentially it's the same thing i go through the script i find the value of the script if the, the value of the script is two million dollars which is still a low budget film this is you know and people go two million dollars yeah if you're spending two million dollars yeah you should throw your hands up in the air and be like that's ridiculous. But independent filmmakers don't spend the $2 million. They spend a fraction of that because the $2 million value on the film and you play within the rules of the guild because at the end of the day, you want to sell this film. You want to take it to theaters. You want it to live on a streaming service. All those major players play nice with the artist guilds. And the reason they do that is because that is the bread and butter of their business. Without the artists, they don't have films. And so... It, that's what we have to start to talk about is that you play nice inside this budget, but you fendangle the rules to work in your favor. And you do that by creating soft money. So I'm confused in regards to the valuation of the uh, of the product. So if you're if you're making a movie for 100,000 and you're valuing it as 2 million, I still haven't heard the way to do that. So all of the positions have to be filled, right? So right. everything that that is on a film has to be filled. But if I give you a position in writing that you can do that in pre-production and you're my writer and then i bring you in as my director and then you are covering two positions i only pay you for one thing right, right? so you get four kind of predator filmmakers together and you run basically these you know so you're getting more all. so basically the bot the model that you're talking about is, is you're creating a bigger bank for your buck so it's like someone like myself who can come in, write, direct, produce, edit, yes. DP, bring in their own camera gear. I'm bringing a tremendous amount of value to the yes. project that doesn't- Soft actually, money. Yeah, which is all soft money. So basically when I made my film on the corner of Ego and Desire, when I made it for about $3,000 hard costs, the value that I presented was probably anywhere between fifty dollars to $100,000, purely Correct. because of all the stuff that I was able to do as, if, as, if, as, as someone coming into that thing. That's great, but I'm not sure how that, um, 
how, okay, so continue with your process because you asked yeah, me to so, poke holes, so I'm going to poke holes if I see yeah, something. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the the point is like if I get, let's say I get four Alex Ferraris, I, I get my cloning machine. That's, impo that's, that's impossible. That's impossible, sir. There is only it's one impossible. of me, obviously. There is only one of you, but <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get some cousins. If there, was four, <laughs> if there was four of me, I would rule the world. Let's just put that straight up. <laughs> Okay, so we'll get one of you, and then we'll get kind of the second tier Alex Ferraris. Okay, copies, so we'll they're Alex copies. With so they're copies. So every copy becomes less and less hustle because it yeah, just degrades less. by the copy. <laughs> it's kind of like that old uh, what's it, that old movie with Michael Keaton, Multiplicity. Uh, multiplicity. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. <laughs> it. So we multiplicity Alex Ferrari here, and then. Sure. Uh, so we got four of you, right? So yeah. now think about all the positions you're going to cover, right? You're going to write, you're going to direct, you're going to shoot, you're going to produce, you're going to uh, maybe edit. do lights, all you're going to edit, yeah. you're going to do color, you're going to do all your DIT, you're going to do your data management, you're mm -hmm. going to do everything, right? You're going to do your, your sound design. Well, now I only have to pay four employees to get all those things. How much did all those other things cost? Now... I'm going to ask you, you four, to do that for two years and make me four films. Each mm -hmm. of you get to run the helm at four films. You do it over the course of two years. Now, I'm going to pay you your minimum. I'm going to pay you and Alex 2 and Alex 3 and Alex 4 the minimum amount of money you need to survive. And what's going to happen is, is you're going to see that the difference between what you should have made if you were writing, directing, producing, and doing all these things through the unions, what you should have made, that giant gap is going to create a huge amount of soft money. Mm -hmm. That is what you own as uh, as the filmmaker, right? That's mm -hmm. your, basically your deferment. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is then you actually get the hard money to pay you and Alex 2 and Alex 3 and Alex 4. You get that hard money for your minimum basic living, Those that money from an investor, and you pay that money back first. So if you're, let's say your minimum amount you absolutely have to have is $50,000. Now I'm making a movie that might cost me, you know, uh, $2 million on paper. I have these four people who are creating this huge amount of savings. So maybe a million dollars in savings. So I basically have you guys all for $200,000. I'm saving a million dollars. Now I only need $800,000 in order to make four movies because you're going to work for you're going to work for two years on that on that salary essentially and that's so, kind of the okay so you're basically creating a slate of films and basically hiring right. everybody salary to create these these forms of to create these products so i mean it's 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 simple economics basically so as opposed Correct. to hiring out freelancers to build your and i always use this olive oil business um yeah. so if you if you hire out freelancers to build the bottles bottle the models do all this and that so like when i had my uh when i had my olive oil company which again if no one has heard of this that's a whole other story for a whole other day but when i had my olive oil gourmet shop i had staff I, per, I, you know, I paid them a salary. They sat there and they bottled olive oil by hand in my my factory, which was my my store. So by doing that, I was able to create based on paying them an hourly rate. How many bottles could I fill? How much product could I create based on the hourly? Now, if I would have paid them per bottle or mm -hmm. per groups of bottle as a freelancer, the value wouldn't have made sense. This is That's right. This is basic economics for any business when you hire a salary versus a freelancer or a contract worker. But you're trying to create that model within a cinematic slate of well, films. Exactly, and within the independent scene, because we, we, we talk about independent, and part of the problem is that we branded ourselves as independent, so that literally means by yourself. Right. We, we, we really, really... Independent should be huge. independent of the studio system, independent yeah. of the system, not independent like I'm all by myself. It's a way yeah, I but we, but yeah. we branded ourselves that way, right? By being renegade and kind of being like solo entrepreneurs and this yeah, sort yeah. of like, look, look at me running around with all my gear all over my body. I don't like, know what we, you're talking about. I've never done anything like that <laughs> so, at all, ever. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's a, I, I'm sure there's some behind the scenes of. Uh, well, there's a picture of me on this is Meg with like this huge rig with the camera and the mic hanging. Yeah. I mean, literally, if I had a broom up my butt, just I could start cleaning the floors while I shot. It was insane. Well, that's but that's the whole point, right? And so as you have this this um, independent kind of branding that we've given sure. ourselves, and we feel like we have to work alone, but we don't. In fact, it, it's actually so much better to work with multiple people because if you put everybody in an equity position 
So like I work in post-production and you worked in post-production and you know that post-production is a service-based industry. Correct. So they come to me and they hand me a film and they hand me money to, to work on the film. And I edit and uh, you know we do the assembly or we do whatever we do, in the, the online, the color, whatever it is that we do, uh, VFX, I get paid for that service. I own nothing when it comes to that film. But the only way to actually scale up your business is to own a piece of equity. Correct. And that's and so what happens is, is then if you take the the savings that you had in your soft money, that becomes your equity investment in your film. And so when I turn around and I go out and I raise this eight, you know, eight hundred or a million dollars or whatever it is, I then can turn around with that same group of filmmakers and make a very, very strong claim that fifty percent of this movie actually is mine because of just the equity play. Right. And, and, and the one thing I, I've always said multiple times in the show is like if someone showed up with half a million dollars for me, I wouldn't make 10 to 12 movies with that half a million dollars. I would not try to make one movie. I want – because right. making a movie is like pulling a pulling a slot machine. So I would rather have 12 shots as opposed to one shot to, to – Yeah, sit down and play some hands of poker, right? Like if we're going to play, let's, let's pl- play. Like let's not pull the slot machine. Let's play the game. Let's learn the rules. Correct. And let's have a strategy. Shocking. And then – yeah, amazing. Okay. And, and, then, and then and then place your bets accordingly, right? So if you know that you got one that's a little bit soft in, in the slate of films, that's fine. Just do that one as best as you can. Recoup as much as you can. It can't be zero. But then do the next one, and then maybe you're going to want to gamble a little bit more on that one. And so what you have to do with these films, let's say, again, I'm using four because it, sure. you know, you, you can nice do number. four films. Yeah, you can do four films in two years. And you can tolerate any people for two years at a time, right? Yeah, so, I've met some people in the business. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna call shenanigans on that one. No, you cannot. But, but you get to handpick them. You, you get, get to, to handpick, handpick them. them. And if someone has to go, they have to go, and you hire and you place somebody else in there. And it's just part of it's just part of what you're creating. So you're basically just creating a production company that has a slate of films where you're hiring crew um you know that can do multiple jobs so like you know if you hire a dp it's a dp who owns their own camera their own lenses their own grip truck maybe you and and you pay them a salaried position where they're getting general they're getting a steady income guaranteed every day or you know for months at a time and something that's going to make sense for them uh and or some sort of equity in the project that they're creating and kind of making it more of a communal way of making films on the making side of it, actually producing the product. Is that basically what you're telling me? Basically, yeah. And so because that person, you know, that DP would get hired on maybe one film a year or one every couple of years, things, you know, that sort of it's thing. Rough, that, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's it. you know, what I'm doing is I'm guaranteeing that you will work on at least two films for the next two years. So I'm guaranteeing that that salary. And so then what I'm doing is basically saying, your value is based on the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, what you should make working on this. What's the least amount you're willing to take? Everything that you create in soft money becomes your piece of the equity in the overall budget. Which is, so, now, go ahead. Yeah, so I understand what you're saying. So it's, again, the, the basics is you're just creating more value by leveraging time and amount of films in, but you're in, dialing down the spend as well. Correct, and you're dropping the budgets because yes. of that. You're just you're just being smarter with your money, which sounds great. And I agree with the I agree with the concept. So the concept of actually pro- the production of the film makes sense, and it's something that I've done many times in the past. Uh, I haven't done a slate of them uh, per se. I've done it one offs. But if you you know if I people always ask like Alex, why don't you make like five or six movies a year at your budget range, which is going to be under $10,000. I'm like, I could if I want to, but I don't. I have, I'm busy doing other things right now. Um, but I could easily do that without question because I have the infrastructure to do it. I have crew that I could do it with. And your model, I could easily bring to crew members that I work with and they would be on board without, yeah. without question. But the question I have for you then is the production is great. And you're able to make your movies at a much more affordable rate. What is the business model to recoup? What is the distribution model and how can you generate revenue from these films? 
Okay, so yeah, that's great. So essentially what you're doing is you're going to do uh, kind of a your day and date is going to look a little bit, uh, and I don't know how familiar your audience might be with day and date release, but that's basically you drop it into a theatrical space and then you put it on a transactional video on demand, which means you're paying to either rent or buy that property. So your theatrical, you just go right to, you can just go right to exhibitors and say, I have a finished film. This is my feature film. This is what it looks like. This is who's in it. This is the trailer. This is the key art. And they will say, yeah, I, you know, let's do a, a 60-40 or a 50-50 of the gate. And you show that there's actually like people in your community that want an audience. to come see this thing, an audience. Yeah. And so that means you have to have done the work ahead of time to get to that point. But essentially, you're distributing it either directly to the theatrical exhibitors yourself, or you just partner with a theatrical distributor who already exists in the space who does independent films. And there's tons of them. That, there's tons of yeah, them. Yeah, so I was going to say this, and this is something that I think is one of the big kernels, nuggets of gold that you're throwing out there, is that the, there is I, – I do truly believe that the theatrical experience is not a growth industry for no. – as a general statement, it is not where everyone's going. It is not where, I mean, tickets have either flattened or are in, de are in decline. The occasional big tent pole will maybe jump that number up, but people aren't going more to the theaters. They are watching more streaming content. They're also not renting or buying as much as they used to. That's, that's, that's a holdover from the video store days. And the, as the new generations are growing, concepts of renting and buying of, of buying a movie is pretty awkward because like you could just go to Netflix or Hulu or one of the many streaming services to watch. But the one thing I want to bring out here is that there is a big opportunity for independent filmmakers to fill the void that the studios are leaving yes. behind in the theatrical space. As crazy as that sounds, if you use different models like I talk about in my book, like the regional cinema model, or being able to bring in uh, an audience and you can target audiences, or if you go after a niche and you can prove that a niche. The, I just released a podcast yesterday on Film Entrepreneur, which was about um, how the documentary Awake, The Life of Yogananda, uh, did gangbusters theatrically because they were able to target the audiences of followers of Yogananda in theatrical throughout the country and throughout the world. So there is a huge market there. Do you have any advice on how to get into those theat in those theaters? Yes, without a, without a middle without a middleman too. I would prefer man, yeah. I would prefer so, not to go to the theatrical so distributor. This is and, and this is the thing is like so traditionally you needed to have like a sales agent, someone who's going to help you right. kind of control the sales, right? But because you are your own brand for each of these movies, right? You are the filmmaker, so you are the brand. So what you should be doing with that is be building up the audience that you're going to carry with you into these theatrical spaces, which means you know building up that following either on social media platforms or even a Patreon. A Patreon could actually be your TVOD. That Correct. actually is realistic to have a Patreon actually be your, look, uh, drop me a buck every month or five bucks every month and I'll give you all access to everything that I do behind the scenes and you create kind of a, like almost like a, like a corridor crew. I love those guys. Put them, you know, kind of like, but you're showing how the sausage gets made behind all these films. And then that becomes valuable to an audience who wants to learn about filmmaking and how this thing was done all the way from start to finish. So that's how you can own your TVD. Now, if you go to a theatrical space, you can do targeted analytics for a specific theater. Uh, there's a, a company called Comscore. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're familiar with them and you can literally go based on, look, this, this exists right here. And all the films, all the com uh, comparable films that I have, my films are like this, have performed really well in this area. So that means that my demographic is in that area. So now what do I do? I pump money within, you know, maybe 10, 15 miles. I'm not sure what the exact mobilization rate is around this specific theater. But you start pumping your marketing dollars into that actual radius demographic for those people. And you try and drive them to that one point of sale. And that one point of sale, whether it's successful or not, it doesn't matter because theatrical is just about marketing. It's just about amplifying the voice that you have. So as soon as my film goes to the theaters, I now have that much more street cred, mm -hmm. right? And now I, I am a poster that someone walked by as they went up to the go and see whatever Disney was showing. They saw my poster in there. And then when they see my poster, 
when they're scroll, scrolling through Hulu or Amazon or Apple TV or whatever it is, they go, oh, I recognize that. That marketing spend that I had called theatrical now causes them to click on it. And that creates revenue for me. Yeah, it's it's just about the model is is it makes sense. But the ROI is the issue for me, because for you to do a mark, if, if you can break even on the marketing spend, meaning that if you can break even on theatrical sales, whether that be through actual box office or actually selling merch um, or some sort of ancillary product lines while doing that screening at either conventions or theatrical or whatever you do. If you can break even or actually make a profit at that point, then this model makes sense. But if you are losing money theatrically and then you're hoping that people that happen to pass by or look at a poster are going to yeah, stick out, it's going to be rough. Right. But you're not talking about a huge number. At $2 million, like you need 50,000 people That's to see this movie. That's a lot of people. 50,000 people. Yeah, but it's it's not a lot of people if you actually turn these things into like events. If you're going to a Agreed. city and, and you're running an event on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. and you're going to be there for a Q&A afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Right? You're touring. You're, you're, you're touring, basically. You're going on exactly. tour with the movie. Yeah, it's, it, you're, you're basically Frankensteining, like you said earlier, you're Frankensteining a bunch of different models trying to put something together that makes sense. So you're taking the best of every little bit trying to put together right. this entire model. And so I because, understand. So because there's multiple Alex's involved in this, right? One Alex can be, you know, running their premiere event in Philadelphia True. and another Alex can be running the premiere event in a different city. And, and you can kind of be grooming those, those, uh, those markets. And so after you've done that weekend, you've now saturated the market with you know, maybe two or three or four screenings and they've got to see you face to face and there's a reason to come out because it's an actual event and they can get their photo taken and you saturate that market with maybe 3,000 people that are now out there talking about this movie and they are bringing in new eyeballs and then the theaters actually want to do a split with you. So mm -hmm. if you had to four wall it for just your little events because they're like, oh, we're not sure, we're not sure, that's fine, you four wall just that one. But the theaters need more movies. They just simply need more movies and they need it for more demographics. And so if you say, like you've been saying, if you, you niche down and you know that niche and you know how to get to them and you know where they live and where they are and you can actually mobilize them to the movie theater, then you can put that in front of them and then there's a whole reason for them to go out into their communities and say, you know that niche I like, this is a movie about the niche that I like and that's the word of mouth marketing or what they call buzz that actually brings new eyeballs to come and see that. And the, the theaters love those kinds of deals because a 50-50 for them is a better deal than they're going to get from any of the studios. Right. And the thing is that, again, everything you're talking about really does come back down to the riches or in the niches. Like it, it is about bringing, niching down. You're not doing four movies that are broad spectrum like a romantic comedy, a generalized drama you know, a generalized horror movie or something like that. You're creating very niche product for niche audiences within this model, which That's now you've now now you've now hedged your bets even more because now you have an audience that you can actually reach as opposed to creating, oh, I'm just going to make a romantic comedy for $100,000 with no stars in it and hope somebody finds it. Like that's you. You'll die. It's over. It's dead. Um, but I do. Oh, I but do. you good. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you, niche, you niche down to a place where then you, you provide them with material that they then want to announce. Correct. Because if, if you niche down and it's only something that can be shared within the niche, it's really only got that narrow amount of time. And you can do that and make money in that Very thing. Well. But, the way, but the way to make money in theatrical is actually to grab the niche and then have the niche want to tell their friends who aren't in the niche about it. That's the word of mouth marketing. That's the piece that creates those 4x and 10x films that then can carry your whole production slate and so you're niching down with the content on the screen but then in this sort of model again if you're showing how the sausage is made on the back side of it then those people feel the same sort of uh, reciprocity for the person who's sharing that information with them and they're potentially paying you here in your transactional video on demand uh, or patreon kind of style uh window and then they're also paying for you inside your theatrical window and they're mobilizing themselves and friends when you come to town with the events uh, and you, you, you know, you talk about whatever it is. If it's the vegan chef, 
mm-hmm. right? You do the vegan chef seminar and you bring in uh, the, you know, a, a vegan caterer to the premiere, yeah. uh, you know, and have them sponsor the event. And those are the sorts of things that you do at, but the, you're not going to have to pay that vegan chef to come there. That's free marketing for them. They're going to love that, right? It's a it's a movie about – that's the thing about our business is it is the sexiest business because everyone wants to be involved in it in some way, shape, or form and because it elevates um, everything you're doing. Now, uh, go ahead. Yeah, you have a question. You know, I, so it's, it's we, I want to just kind of reiterate what you were saying in regards to um, the – the kind of the reality show style process of explaining and showing you how the sausage is made and you know to give everybody listening an example is my film on the corner of ego and desire i've been talking about this movie for better part of two years now at this point and people have been asking me left and right like oh when are you going to release it when are you going to release it i've been busy i've been busy it is coming out in january but the point is that i've talked about this film so much and it is so perfectly positioned for my niche audience that you know, now people are dying to see it and also consume other products or other things that I'm creating about it. And I've already been, I've already made money before the movie ever got released because I've yeah. been able to create other ancillary revenue streams from just talking about it because that's a model that I've been able to build up with Indie Film Hustle. Uh, and I did the same thing with This Is Meg, my first film before then. So it is possible, but this is a long game. This is not a short play. This is a long game oh, play. Yeah. And that's how filmmakers need to see their film but careers. It's, but it's a career. You're, you're not, right. You're, it's not a lottery I mean, ticket. <laughs> but there is no filmmaker who doesn't want to make a career of it. But you have right. like it's exactly like you say you have to play the game. We, we have to sit down and play several hands at the same time. And that showing how the sausage is made, like the backside of that thing is so valuable. Consider that like how many people can't afford to go to film school or any post-secondary for that reason, for that matter. Now, uh, that's uh, an underprivileged, underserved community, and we wonder why we don't have stories coming out in those communities. Uh, why it is that uh, everything is homogenized through the lens of New York and LA, right? Like, because those are prohibitively expensive cities to live in, right? I, I live in middle America. I can't mm-hmm. afford to live out in New York or LA. I just simply can't. And a lot of storytellers are, are in the exact same place, but there is no monopoly on story, there is no monopoly on talent. Right. L.A. has got a real housing problem crisis right mm-hmm. now. People Tell me about being, it. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here. Trust I, me. Yeah. But it's too ex- it's too expensive to go there and do a startup business. That doesn't make sense. Mm. It, it it makes sense if you want to go and serve someone else's vision who's already got like, a, you know, a strong foothold. But you're talking about regional filmmaking with regional releases, and then you're making kind of these communities uh, around those things. Are you familiar with um, Dunbar's number? Mm, I've heard of it. Explain it to me, please. So the theory of Dunbar's number is like you can have close personal relationships with anywhere between, you know, 200 and 300 people. These are the people that are your family, your friends, your coworkers. So essentially what you're doing is you're creating this you know, within that 200, so you definitely keep some friends and family and keep, you know, those things. But then the other people that you want to try and find are people that you want to work with, people who are artists, people who are DPs, people who are, you know, willing to serve an idea. And you can all work together to, you know, rise, raise the tide. So you have your filmmaking crew and you guys live to, like you live in relatively in those communities and you make films together. That's regional filmmaking. And then you amplify that into your you know, little network again, uh, and that network is going to be, you know, 2000. Once you get away from that first, uh, the first 200 or 300 that you can actually have, there's only about 2000 people because you're going to all have shared connections. So there's only about 2000 people around that community that you call that your tribe. Mm -hmm. And your tribe is probably bigger because you've got other people pulling you in. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, like the real, real hardcore ones, the evangelicals for indie film has hustle is probably about 2000. Mm-hmm. And that's enough to c- create like a sustainable living for one person. But what you're trying to do is expand that over and over and over again. And by creating the content around these 200 and then making a 2000, it's the same thing. The film itself becomes this 200 Thing. You need to find those 200 evangelicals for this film. They're going to create these networks around them. And if you can create them in different cities and you can kind of make this tour with your film, all of a sudden you start being able to feed the whole. 
The thing is that, and the one thing that I would like to add to this model that you're talking about is that the, unlike the olden days where you had to go around on a tour like this to make money, which you still can, but now these 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 content can live forever online. So mm-hmm. for me, I release a, an immense amount of content, but my catalog of content is watched and listened to every second of every day. Someone's listening to something or watch something I've done or read something I've done over the course of the last four and a half years. So every day that goes by, I add to the catalog. Now, the, the big difference is my addition to the catalog is extremely affordable because it's a podcast, it's an article, it's a video. It's nothing that's costing me hundreds of thousands of dollars. So for, that's right. for filmmakers, it's a little bit more costly. But if you start building this, this kind of ecosystem, which includes uh, articles, includes videos on YouTube, includes this kind of ecosystem of products and services that are dedicated to a niche, then you could start slowly building up a business. I mean, I didn't just wake up and, you know, have 4 million downloads or 5 million downloads on my podcast, like overnight. It took years of work to do, and it, and it still mm-hmm. takes a lot of work to keep that going. But it's given me the position where I am now, where I can go out and make a movie. I could write a book. I could do whatever I want. And I'm very happy and grateful for that. And that's where all filmmakers need to come to. They have to build this kind of ecosystem business for themselves, or if I may say, a film entrepreneur-like business um, around their art so they can constantly, constantly do it. And to a point where the movie, if they're smart, the movie almost becomes a loss leader if they've created a good amount of product and services around it where at the beginning you're you're exploiting the movie for actual revenue from the film mm-hmm. but like many examples I talk about in my book where they, they the filmmakers literally give it away now they're like just take it because I know when you watch it you're going to come over here because you're interested in my niche and look at all the products and services and information that you're actually looking for how can I be of service to you and that is the key of filmmakers moving forward in my opinion yeah and 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 if we look at this again let's go back to like the problems that are actually in the marketplace right so you take that thing to the theaters or uh, or you have it and you don't think that it has theatrical legs, but you've already started to drive an audience to it. Well, guess what? That is now valuable to who? The streamers. Those people who don't have your subscribers already, guess what? When your film goes to their platform, they'll pick up the subscription of uh, you know, Paramount Network or they'll pick up the subscription for Peacock or whatever it is just to watch your film. Now you've actually tangibly moved the needle for that business and it is part of their catalog. That's what those businesses are, right? It's just a giant catalog. They're not really producing their own stuff for the most part. They're putting money into it, but what they do is they put the money into it and they hire people in a service agreement, uh, basically all over the country. They go find the best tax incentive and they drop the money in there, recoup a piece of that tax incentive. And so they're reducing the cost of what that uh, that is. And we here in Utah have uh, High School Musical, which is on Disney Plus, And we have uh, Yellowstone, which is on uh, the Paramount, Paramount Network. And those are running on – and those are relatively um, – big franchise properties and it's being done by all my friends like that's just people that are in our community who we rub shoulders with and you know you see all the time so you can take those same people who now have pedigrees of working for these major studios and why not make a business that has those professional resources if they're good enough professional resources for those big major studios then they're definitely good enough for your independent films rally those people together and create the business model model around that and then if you really want to like give uh, an opportunity to another group of people who are underserved there are investors who actually want to invest in films and who are not allowed because if you have the major studios who create these slates of films, so, uh, you know, like I said, Disney's going to do 17 films. So they have one giant uh, equity fund, essentially, that's capturing all this money from their private investors. You're either in or you're out. And if you're out, you're basically out forever. So you always have to put this money in. doesn't matter what's in the slate of films. But those things make money. They have $5 billion uh, box office returns this year alone. That's, you know ridiculous so yes you want to put money into there but other investors don't get the opportunity to invest in films that are going to have 
recognizable talent and a theatrical release and have some measure of quality. People want that. They want to invest in that because that's fun. It's sexy. Entertaining. It's yeah, sexy. it's sexy and it's entertaining and, it's, and they want that, but they want to do it prudently. So you diversify the risk by doing it in a slate deal with them. And so you're, you are mitigating their risk. I would never, ever, 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 ever advise someone to invest in one single film because that Agreed. is super dangerous, right? I agree. It's super uh, risky. You could lose it. You could lose it all. One single act of God. No, you, you will. Lose, you you will lose it all. I mean, it's two percent <laughs> of film independent films actually make their money back, and there's a reason for that because you're putting all that pressure on one film to carry all the weight. Where if you if you take like I said, if you have five hundred thousand dollars, you make ten to twelve movies off of that, which mm-hmm. is doable and still very respectable budgets, anywhere between forty five and fifty thousand or forty and fifty thousand dollars per episode, which I know a lot of people are going, how can you make a real movie with that? I'm like, I've made two that and they're both sold and they're both making money and I don't care. So it's all depending on the kind of stories you're trying to tell. And and if you're in within a niche, imagine if you had a, the vegan niche and I'm yeah. gonna uh, the vegan chef movie and uh which is by the way We're gonna enti- make this one easy. We're gonna make this I'm one gonna, one gonna, one by, by, by the way, there's an entire chapter of that in the Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. It's called the Vegan Chef movie. It's fantastic. I just broke it down. By the way, I have a name for it now. It's called Crazy Sexy Vegan. So um it's it's just called Crazy Sexy Vegan. Why not? It's called Crazy Sexy Vegan. Imagine in that niche or the surfer niche or the skateboarding niche, if you made if it was the niche that could support multiple films, imagine if you made 10 vegan themed or plant-based themed movies and you could include some documentaries in there. And imagine if you had a slate of those. Do you know how much money you would make with those? When a movie like Game Changers just showed up and just it was the number one documentary of all time on iTunes and Netflix paid an obscene amount of money to have it two weeks after that original release. You know, that that... That demographic is that, that that niche is huge, or a surfer, a bunch of surfer movies, or yeah. a bunch of skateboarding movies, or a bunch of trombone movies. Well, I don't think that's going to work, but um, you know. But there's those kind of films. Imagine if you created a slate as opposed to one. One, yeah, and that's and that's exactly what you're doing. Is you're you're diversifying the risk for the capital, right? And so then the, the money wants to invest in this thing, and then. So you have people at the front end who want to invest in a diversified portfolio because it's going to be fun for two years to have a new movie. Every six months, you're getting to go to a film premiere. You can invite your friends. You can bring your family. You get the red carpet treatment. Like It it feels fun. That's a good use of your money. And you're supporting a local community of filmmakers. These are the people who live within your region, and you want to support them because they're artists and, heaven forbid, you uh, you, you you don't get to tell the stories that of your community and the niches and things like that that you're involved in. But then you can even now do the the business model of the um, uh, online public offerings, which is the the equity crowdfunding. And you had an episode not too long ago about that, which I highly recommend people go back and listen to. But instead of doing the equity crowdfunding up front, you do an equity crowdfunding when the film is done to support your theatrical. So now I have a film where I'm showing you the key art I'm showing you the publicity. I'm showing you uh, all the behind the scenes and the the special trailers and things like that. Then I create this fund that says, look, you put 300 bucks in here and I'm going to share my box office revenues with you. And that's basically your piece of this, that, this film. So now what have I done? I've created an incentive, a financial incentive where they've invested their $300 into this movie. Now they have a $300 incentive to broadcast this film to as many people as possible. So I share with them all my drop boxes uh, with, with all my assets. trailers and things like all my assets and they can hit their own audience with it. So then you've created an avenue for people with larger followings like yourself or other YouTubers or other people with like niche audiences to financially back you and then also return on that investment because now what you know your mobilization rate with 300 bucks oh yeah i can send 3000 people to cities across the country that is going to churn back your money and you do that just in a few small things with this film and now you're de- de-risking what your theatrical risk goes down your pna spend comes down and the filmmakers are de-risking themselves in the theatrical space, sharing the box office with the audience who will actually mobilize to go and see it. The key, though, to this entire conversation is to keep the budgets low. Yes. To keep the cost of the product 
low. And that's what I keep preaching again and again. And I, I was talking about it at AFM when I was there last week where you you – I talking to filmmakers and they're like, oh, I need, I talked to a couple of filmmakers, they're like, how much do you need? They're like, well, I have a quarter of a million dollar movie, but we need a million. So I'm like, but you have a quarter of a million cash. He's like, yeah, we have 250,000 now, but we need a million. And they had this whole package and everything. And it was, and I don't want to talk about exactly what kind of movie it was, but it was a, a movie that, uh, and I told them, I'm like, do you want me to tell you the truth? And they said, yeah. And they're like, you need to make this movie for $75,000. And if you're smart, you'll make two or three movies with that $250,000, if not five movies with that $250,000. Because you're going to spend another seven years chasing the $750,000 and you won't be able to make money back with this. I promise you. You just – like, who's your cast? What's your theme? This is, And it was just – it did not pass the mustard. So yeah. if you drop that budget as low as possible – and I would always tell people as well when I, I had uh, people that would, I talked to, I go, look – if you have thirty thousand dollars, you're like, I know you want that techno crane shot, but can you get away with it? <laughs> like, how much does that techno crane add to the bottom what's line? It, yeah, and like, what's it worth? It, yeah, what's it worth? It's like again, I'll go back to my olive oil. So if I have a bottle and my bottle is gold, it's a golden bottle. It's made of pure twenty four karat gold. It still has olive oil in it and has a diamond encrusted cap on it or or a cork on it. Okay, how much more money am I going to generate? How much, how much more revenue can I generate by adding really embellishments that the core customer doesn't care about? Yeah. You know, like one or two people are going to buy that. I'd love to meet these people. But so, so someone's going to buy a 24 karat bottle of olive oil. Sure. Someone will always buy something. But in the long term, does that techno crane add any more dollars to your bank account? Does it add any more audience? Like, can you tell the story? in a slightly more affordable way. I know it's nice. Look, I, I've shot with a technocrane. If I could live on a technocrane, I would. It is wonderful. <laughs> but does it make financial sense to ha occur that? Right. And, and, that's the, and that's the calculus that uh, filmmakers, you know, and when we're in art mode, like when we're in art mode, I don't think that we actually should be thinking too much about that. Like we really should create from a, a space of purity. But then like when you take your first steps back, like you need to go, oh my gosh, this is so not going to happen. So either I have to do something else or I have to make this fit within the resources and things that I have in order, in order to create. But the, I guess the point that I really want to like emphasize is that this community idea and the community of face-to-face of -face and working with people uh, creates these regional pockets of the film and those things can live just in those regional areas. There's filmmakers here in Utah that have been doing this for 10, 12 years, oh, living yeah. off, living off of just like, uh, the, the regional the cinema model, the regional yeah, cinema the model, regional cinema model. And then they are releasing it just to the small pockets and niche communities in this area. They have been doing that for 10 years. So now what I'm now, what you're saying is to build on top of that. That's, what you want to do is build on top of that. So now you are bringing in people who want to be involved in the film business. Uh, imagine if at the front of your theatrical screening, you had a, this film is brought to you theatrically by, and it's all the people who invested in your equity crowdfunding campaign, their Twitter handles or whatever sure, it is sure, sure. where their businesses are. That is a huge value to someone because it's entertainment, which is what captures eyeballs and attention. And that's what people absolutely want in their businesses. And so you don't need to spend a huge amount of money. That $250,000 uh, filmmaker, right, they're already at the point where they can make a million dollar movie because the, the magic formula is 25% in capital, 25% in debt, 25% in pre-sales, 25% in uh, incentive funding. Now, pre-sales is going away. So what it's you're going to do. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. So you replace that piece with equity for your service positions. And now the, everyone dials down their costs. Right. But the thing is, uh, $250,000 in today's market plan, in, in today's – the old traditional model is is destroyed I, by the time this episode airs. I've already released that episode. <laughs> but it's, it's gone. It's official now. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's official. No, like literally the traditional film distribution model is dead. It's mm -hmm. dying a miserable death and, and people are trying to hold on to it. It happened in publishing. It happened in the music industry business it's happening here the model of making money with the art in this industry has changed just like it did in, yeah. in music just like i did in publishing it's just adjusting it's a it's a it's a titanic shift 
in the way we do business and the way we create art. And people really need to understand that. And uh, real quick, I want to go back to what we were saying about if the technocrane makes sense or not. Do you remember the, did you ever hear the story of uh, Michael Bay on Bad Boys for that one shot? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So Michael Bay's first movie was called Bad Boys with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And he had no power because he was still just a commercial director. And he wanted to, to – to, there was a scene in the movie, which I just recently saw. It was so much fun. Um, there, was, um, there was a scene in the movie at the end where there's a big shootout with all the drug dealers in, 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 a, in an airplane hangar. And there's one scene where one of the villains – explodes out of the airplane that's parked and it just explodes okay. in a fiery ball of flame into like it explodes out of it and into uh, like a pile of yeah, whatever he wanted that shot he wanted that shot so badly that the, that the line producer wouldn't give it to him and he's like what would it cost to come in tomorrow early for two hours and get that shot and they did the numbers and it was sixty thousand dollars to do the shot the one shot it's on screen for Three seconds, four seconds, right? And he paid for it out of pocket because he, as an artist, wanted that shot. Yeah. Now, on a, you know, and there's arguments on both sides here. Like, did he have to do that? Would the movie have been successful without spending that $60,000? Yes. There's no doubt in my mind yeah. that the movie would have not lost any box office whatsoever without that shot. But at the artist in him, wanted to do it but you know what he did he ponied up his own money to yes. do his art and that is the big difference that filmmakers don't get if you want the technocrane and you want to dig into your credit card because you want the technocrane shot and the production can't afford it go for it but understand what you're yeah. doing yeah yeah and this and this applies to all artists right like I, I, i'm an actor right if i get a good script that comes uh, it comes to me and i'm like this is amazing uh you pay me just to keep me alive and I will defer everything else. Mm -hmm. And other actors are no different. Now their managers are, and their agents are going to say, no, don't do that. Right. They're going to say, no way. Don't do that. Cause for them, they get their paid 10%. off of their percentage. Yeah. Their percentage. And then also their publicist and their lawyer. And you know, by the time it gets to them, they're making 40, you know, 40 cents on the dollar. Yeah, 10 million doesn't go as far as it used to. You only take home maybe three, four million after taxes. I mean, it's not really, who can live off of that, really? <laughs> right. Well, but independents can go to uh, actors uh, yes. and they do all the time. Go to an actor and say, look, I want to pay you a SAG minimum deal to work on this film for mm -hmm. however many, you know, sure. two weeks or three weeks. Sure. Try and shoot them out as fast as you possibly can. And they will say yes to the things that they think are good yes. and if you've got a strategy to put that into the theater then you give them box office bonuses because they are the vehicle they are that uh, the protagonist or antagonist or whatever it is that they're playing in your film that people recognize that's their brand and you double them up every time you double up or you give them uh, you know the first take off the top in order to get them whole because right. at the end of the day they are artists as well, and that's their sacrifices to work at a lower rate to work on your film, and everyone will do that. It's the, the problem is when filmmakers take advantage of people's passion and say, do it for free, and that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of filmmakers who don't know how to say no. There's a lot of crew people who don't know how to say no. There's a lot of actors who don't know how to say no because they're being given an opportunity, but you can't live on zero. No, without question, without question. I neither, you know, when I make my films, I either pay them minimum or I give them some value that is worth their time, whether that be a service, whether that be an exchange of services, whether that be, there's something that yeah. I give them that, that they're willing to do the work for. And it's also, I'm not working them 20 hour days. It's a lot of things right, yeah. like that about it. But the one thing I also wanted to say here is that the, the what we're talking about is uh, with the actors and, and and you know coming up piece everybody is becoming on everyone's becoming a film entrepreneur whether they know it or not yeah. every all the actors all the all the crew people the distribute you know distribution and everyone's becoming film entrepreneurs you have to become entrepreneurial in the way because the old model is broken is breaking down if not broken down completely already where student where actors aren't getting 30 million dollars up front anymore those days generally are gone for the most part there are exceptions of course but I remember, remember the whole days like when people were paying three, four million dollars for a oh, script, yeah. and then and then you know Arnold was making twenty five million for Batman and Robin. Like those days are gone. Now yeah. there's back end participation. There's gross points. There's they're they're working. They're partners with the studio and they're leveraging That's their right. own fame and talent 
with the studio's money and marketing because they understand that. And this is a shift that happened in the, in the music industry years ago where there is very little money now in the music. Like yeah. there, there are this, the record sales and the publishing money that you used to get is not what it was before. Like I, I read an article where, you know, Pharrell, um, the, 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 yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the artist who did Happy, Everyone's yeah, Happy, that, that song. Do you, know, do you know? No, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> he played that, that movie streamed on Spotify a billion times. A billion times it streamed. He owns the, the right on he, He's the publisher on that. How much do you think he made on publishing off of, off of, off of Spotify? Oh, man. Uh, off a billion, off okay, a billion, yeah. off a billion. Yeah, but it's so minimal. It's minimal because it's going to be a fraction of a penny. Like, that's the so thing. So it's, like, it's a billion. So how many, how much do you think? I'm going to say. It's one of the biggest, say, movie, biggest just, songs. Just, just, just biggest. under a million. Yeah. $1,857. He made off of publishing $1,857. Not the sales, not the stream. This is the publishing aspect of it. He might have made more off the streaming, but it was not much. It was made some money. But the publishing, where publishing used to be gold, used to make obscene amounts with publishing, $1,800. He does a whole article. He's like, I can't, I, I, if, if a billion dollar, if a billion streamed song makes $1,800, what hope is there? So the, the, the money's not in the music anymore. The money's in the brand, the artists, the ancillary product lines, the sponsorships. That's what they started doing. There's bands that go on the touring because you can't bootleg a tour. You know, you, you right. can't bootleg that experience. So now I heard bands who are, selling vip tickets where you can come backstage for like 250 bucks get an autograph and a picture with the band after the show yeah. and that's how they're making their money because well, their access uh, access has now become a comedy it's insane well, and it's and the collapse of that industry though is, is actually quite sad because you see artists who are creeping up into their 70s and their 80s still on tour because they never quite hit the threshold to retire Mm. And so, well, the Rolling Stones are doing. The Rolling Stones are doing. Yeah, okay. they're, yeah they're, I mean, they're, they're doing. They're bon Jovi's right. not crying. I'm not crying for Bon Jovi, Rolling Stones, Aerosmith. They're all doing fine because they they yeah, were good. And they're fine. But it's the yeah. ones that it's the it's the little bit lower tier, the ones that have been grinding at it for years. And, oh, and po- that is- I just I just saw the Poison, Motley Crue, and yeah. I think somebody else joined force like uh, po- Guns and Roses, like all yeah. like three or four of them for a worldwide tour, which this is gonna do fantastic. But that's they have to make the cash, man. Yeah, well, you're seeing a lot of the 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 middlemen in every in every position going get squeezed, away. right? So it's the people in between the film and the theatrical exhibitions, the people in between the film and the the TVOD or the streaming. Uh, and we have that example of uh, distributor, mm. right? An aggregator, an aggregator actually just and a relatively well established aggregator going under. This is you know you're seeing this crunch, and it's happening in the industry between the the studios right now and the WGA even, right? Because they're packaging material. Those middlemen are creating that, that conflict of interest and the AT, the ATA and the WGA are going at it right now, essentially. And the, go ahead. No, 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 I was, I was about to say this exact issue is what came up. I actually got a few people asked me what I thought about it, which was the, 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 like they got rid of this whole law of the anti, uh, what is it? The you can't a film studio can't just dis- be a theatrical distributor, and they finally got rid of that. And when I when someone asked me, I'm like, didn't they already get rid of that? I mean, Netflix in the eighties, yeah, yeah, like Netflix. I mean, it, it was still on the books, but yeah, yeah. no one enforced it because the second that Warner Brothers was making content for HBO, well, that broke that, and Netflix and all their direct relationships, and that is where everything is going. The theaters, mm-hmm. the, the, the studios don't want to deal with the movie theaters. If they can make the money going directly to Disney Plus, if Disney can make money going directly to Disney Plus, they won't go theatrical. They, if they don't need to share 30, 40, or 50% of their take, where people are going to show up, because look, you know, right now, Frozen 2, the only place Frozen 2 could be seen is Disney Plus. I promise you that'll jump 30 or 40 million subscribers in the course of one weekend. Now, will mm-hmm. they stay? That's the job of Disney Plus to keep you there. But yeah. if they start every, imagine, just imagine a world, and I know this world is coming, imagine a world that now the new Marvel movies, 
the new Star Wars movies, they're all designed for the direct output because they don't need to go theatrical. And if they do go theatrical, yeah. it's kind of like a specialty event or it's not the main revenue source. It's happening already. It's already yeah. happening. I don't know if I, I don't know if you've heard this, and I might have said this publicly before. I'm not sure that I heard through the grapevine that um, Disney was showing a lot of their people how they actually made money with their movies. So it was quadrants. It was like uh, box office. It was yeah. uh, DVD, Blu-ray, home video, and merchandise. And when they came to Frozen, it was like an 80-10-10. So it was like, and that made a billion dollars in the box office. So it was a billion box office, like a billion or so in home video, DVD, streaming, all that stuff. And then 90% or 80% was all merch. And then merch, yeah. do you know That's how right. much, and then you know how much they made off of the dresses? Just the no. dresses, the frozen dresses, just the frozen dresses alone. How much they made? A billion on the dresses. Just on, the, not the other obscene amount of merchandising for frozen. Just the dresses was a billion dollars because that's what they, that's what they care about. That's what, that's where the money is, man. That's what the money is. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why the theatrical is actually important because it elevates your voice. So now you actually have perceptible value to all kinds of other uh, merchandise creators who then would come to you and say, let me license this to stick it on my mugs. Let me license it to put it on my shirts. Let me license this in order to, to create dresses or, or whatever that piece is. But you have to get to that that saturation kind of point where people know that you exist and the theatrical space is the way to do that. And if the currently, the theaters, currently, who knows currently, what's going to happen there. Yeah. But here's the thing is like, we don't stop going to sporting events because we can watch it on TV. We still go just the cost of going to it is going to goes up. Right. And that's what's happening with the theatrical space. Like there's something magical about being shoulder oh, to shoulder yeah. with people screaming and yelling at your favorite team. It's the same thing in the theaters. Right. You you need to feel like you're part of a community. So that's not going to go away. It's just the cost of going to the theater is going up. And we're seeing that because, like you were saying, the ticket sales are going down. But what's happening to the revenue numbers? They're flatlined. They haven't gone down in years. The because the price, because the price keeps going up. The price going goes up. up. Yeah, it goes up based on the number of people. And so, but that's why you're seeing nicer recliners because there's fewer people. You're seeing recliners. You're seeing food show up. You're seeing better screens. You're seeing better sound because now I've got to compete with every home theater system in the entire country. I got to blow those guys out of the water to make this an experience that's actually worth your full subs- your full monthly subscription to you know Netflix or Amazon or or Disney Plus. Because mm-hmm. this is an experience, and that's the that will never go away. That experience will never go away because we will have to have we have to have human contact as human beings. Oh yeah, plays haven't gone away. But, you know, Broadway yeah. Broadway's still doing gangbusters. So you know, and you know, you know, arguably, do you need to go see a play? No, but because you have to be entertained at home. But it's an experience. It's a different kind of art yeah. form and so on. So I agree with you. I don't think theatrical is going to go away completely, but it will morph into a new thing that we don't recognize right now. Yeah, we and, wouldn't but, recognize. And our smaller exhibitors, smaller theatrical exhibitors, are hurting badly for mm. content right now. Yeah, and and it's because there's no dollars up front to get into independent film to allow for someone to control their own destiny through this theatrical space. And so you really have to look at the whole game from mm-hmm. end to end on like how you can actually play this game and create strategies for that. Like I have my strategy and then it might not be the strategies for everybody. Right. But at the end of the day, like the whole point of, of, you know, independent filmmaking is to create a story that then other people can uh, get rally around. Like the purpose of art is not to create art. It's to build communities and relationships and give people a reason to talk to each other who wouldn't otherwise talk to each other. That's the purpose of art. A- Amen, brother. Amen. Preach it, baby. Preach it. Preach it. <laughs> so um, I'm going to because we could talk for another hour about this. But oh, yeah, I'm going yeah. I'm gonna, to I'm gonna ask you a few questions that I ask all of my guests, sir. What Please. advice would you give a filmmaker trying to make it in the business today? Uh, storytelling. Focus exclusively on storytelling, but in all phases of storytelling. So you can storytell on the page, which is the one that we always think about. I and mean, you can start storytell, storytell on the on the on the screen and in post-production, but there's storytelling that can be done with data. I'm using the data points of my film to tell a story in order to create a narrative so under, investors understand what it is that I'm actually talking about. That's a narrative. Focus on that storytelling. Focus on the storytelling of marketing, the why it is people need to get up off their couch and actually experience this event and go to this theater at this specific time 
and, and be a part of a, a larger community. Tell those stories, focus on that kind of storytelling, because the better you can get at weaving those narratives, not just in the three phases that exist in film, but in all the swirling stories that go around it. So when you go out and you do your publicity, all those things, you can be telling good stories because that's ultimately what makes someone want to can engage with you. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Um, fear is just a construct it is completely in here and it, it here quick story when i was a kid i had um I, I had night terrors for years and years like i would wake up so soaking wet from sweat and screaming and i was still in the dream and i would do this over and over and over and over and over again same kind of reoccurring stories and it, it took being awake to realize like I'm going to make decisions in my dreams. I'm going to make decisions in my dreams to control them. And I became a, a lucid dreamer. I was actually able to like stop these night terrors because I could take control of my dream. So now I really focus on lucid living. It's the same sort of idea, right? Let's not let the fear of reality stop us from, from dreaming uh, in real life. And that's the thing that I, you know, you can be a lucid dreamer, you can put that into the world and you can make things happen on your behalf, but you have to be the one in charge of it. You have to be in charge here and here and here. That's awesome. That's a great answer to that question. Um, now three of your favorite films of all time. Oh man. Uh, man, I'm going to, I can't do favorite of all time. Here, I, here's Just three that come to your head right now, sir. Okay. I'm going to give you three that hopefully, um, your audience has either seen or will want to see after I'm done telling you them. Amelie. Amazing film. Uh, uh, yeah, a foreign film, French, wonderful. Um, and then In America. Yeah, I remember that one, yeah. Jim Sheridan, yeah, mm -hmm. really beautiful. And then one just for you, my friend Alex, Fire, Ice, and Dynamite. Why does that, why does that sound familiar? <sighs> Oh man! What? So this is a German film, and the the lore I can't I, I don't know if it's true or not. But so after um, James Bond, the one where they're skiing, uh, uh, Roger Moore, whatever the Roger yeah. Moore one was. So they filmed that in the Alps uh, in Germany. Yeah, right. After he left, they had this crew of stuntmen that had worked on this film, and so they you know got tight and they started to work together and someone comes to them with this script called fire ice and dynamite and essentially it's just the most amazing low budget stunt action film of all time but it's so passionately done that i recommend it like if you just want to have a full-on like turn your brain off and sit back relax and enjoy just 100 percent passion explosions wild stunts like this is the film for you well uh, it's on my list now sir thank you very much for recommending that and now where can people uh, where can people find you and your work uh i'm online uh i do uh some uh, online like free kind of tutorials called previously unknown at previously unknown film on uh, youtube instagram facebook that's where i'm at and then if you want to hit me up on twitter i'm a uh, at regular size ryan <laughs> great twitter handle i like that because i'm assuming at ryan was taken <laughs> yeah it was it was i got there late i got there late and i all i tweet about is like soccer so i don't I mean, but but you can you can if you got a question for me or anything like that i'm more than happy to engage with people ryan man thank you so much for coming on the show brother i appreciate it it's been a pretty cool episode and i hope it's it's kind of spark some like some kindling in their in the tribe's mind about how you can do things and this whole Frankenstein model that you've kind of put yeah. together is is can work if you're able to. There's a lot of there's a lot of elements that need to fall into place, but if you if you're logical about how you put it all together, it's something that can work well, without question. Yeah, I, I, and I'm already doing. I mean, I I I'm not I'm not espousing this as just an ethereal thing. I'm already doing it. I already have partners. I'm already raising. I'm already putting money right now into an escrow. Nice. So like that is it's already happening. So I'm. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep you updated on how it goes. But please, uh, please. Yeah, I we need to pilot this program. Like we need to see what it actually looks like, and if it works, then great, everyone can use it. And if it's not something that actually works, or if there's pieces that do work, then let's make sure that the information and the good information gets out there to the community of filmmakers that are going to make the the stories that myself and 
every generation after us are going to engage with. Amen, brother. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for being on the show, man. I appreciate it. Cheers. Take care, brother.